police procedures, whether or not we need a station. Um, we're gonna touch on that throughout tonight's presentation, the pros and cons, um, but we're just simply to put in layman's term, how do we wanna, what recommendation do you, the committee wanna make to our city council about how we can fund this new police station? Um, so I'm gonna turn over to Matt Brown. He's our city finance director and assistant city uh, um, administrator. And he's been uh, a workhorse in this project. So he's gonna talk a little bit about him and we'll go through the agenda. So I am just gonna do a short introduction. Uh, most of you, I think are familiar with who I am. So as Chief said, I'm Matt Brown. I'm the Assistant City Administrator for the, the City of St. Helens and kind of been working alongside the Chief and Joe and uh, rest of the officers on this project. So um, I'm not gonna take up too much time. I would like to go through and do brief introductions so that everybody gets a chance to meet everybody and find out um, what you do with the city or how you work in the city or live in the city. And then also um, if you can keep it short to you know 30 seconds, 45 seconds and just tell us why you decided to join the committee and why you're here, that would be great. So I'm gonna call off names from the participant list if you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the group. Uh, Chris. Okay, I'm Chris Iverson. I'm the current insurance agent for the city of St. Helens and have been for quite a while. And I'm also a former city councilman and served as the police commissioner during that time. Um, and just uh, also served on the oral review board for the police department for about 20 years. So um, this is something that 22, 23 years ago when I was on the the council, uh, we needed a new department back then. And uh, I, so I think it's very important that we get one built now. Thanks, Chris. Uh, John Walsh. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, John Walsh, I'm the city administrator here. I've been here about eight years now, if you can believe that. And, uh, you know, the echoing what Chris just said about the, uh, the, the police station has been pretty much obsolete since it was built, I think. And there's it's been on my radar and everybody's radar is something that needs to work on. And, uh, it's been picked up, it's been started before, but I think now it has more energy than it has in the past. So we're looking forward to it. And it's nice to see a screen full of uh, familiar faces and fantastic. Stop Thanks. short there. Thanks, John. Uh, Alan Becker. Good afternoon. Um, I'm involved in the community in many ways, but one of the ways is through CERT, the Community Emergency Response Team. And uh, I'm also a retired uh, military, retired Air Force veteran. And uh, so I'm looking forward to um, seeing a bigger police uh, facility because uh, uh, CERT in St. Helens works with St. Helens PD as well as the Sheriff's Department so, and the Fire Department. So it's, um, it'd be exciting to see what, uh, what we can come up with. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Dave. Dave Innocenti. Uh, my wife and I, Kathy, moved out here about 25 years ago. Um, I had a family-owned business in Portland, so I commuted. Now I'm semi-retired. And back in around 2000, 2001, I worked with Terry Moss on some of the first Citizens Police Academy programs that we had. So uh, I'm very involved with that and would just like to see this move forward. Thank right. you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Diane Dillard. Hi, Diane Dillard, former Columbia River Fire and Rescue Board member, retiree from Boise Cascade, and I am on the school-based health center board, Sacagawea. Always been very involved in uh, caring for public safety, so I'm anxious to see us move forward on this project. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Joe Hoke. Hey, Joe, your audio is not working. We'll come back to you. Uh, Keith. Keith Locke here. Been in St. Helens about 40 years. Been on the council 20 years. I've been police commissioner for about 15 years. So uh, been in need of a new police station for a long time. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Joe, you want to give it another shot? Joe's currently at the police station and it's not working. Uh, okay. Shocker. All right. <laughs> well, this is why we're here. Okay, uh, Aaron Salisbury. Hi, I'm Aaron Salisbury. Um, let's see. My husband's been an attorney in St. Helens uh, for about 20 years. He's currently the 
a contract attorney for the Port of St. Helens. So we've lived out in St. Helens about 15 years. Um, so I guess I'm here too, because I'm really interested in our architecture and the way space can do work for you before, uh, before you even have to do work. So uh, a million years ago, I was a general contractor and I did residential modeling in Portland. So it's always been an interest of mine. Um, and frankly, after my tour last week of the station, um, I am so on board to get you guys a new building. So um, I think that's the perspective I come here with. Great, thank you. Uh, Russ Hubbard. Yeah, you got me? Yep. Okay, um, I am uh, currently uh, chair of the St. Helens Planning Commission. And uh, I feel that uh, I could uh, help and assist uh, in this process with design and development. I'm a general contractor. And uh, with my knowledge and design abilities, um, I would like to lend a hand. Thanks. Great, thanks Russ. Uh, Jerry Cummings. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I am the pastor of the St. Helens Missionary Baptist Church. Um, I've only lived in St. Helens about three years. Um, I've been uh, involved as a public safety chaplain many years ago when I lived in Northern California, and I've been involved in uh, uh, school district and, and local government uh, in Mason County, where I used to live in Washington. Um, my interest in this project uh, stems from the fact that when um, you know, when it was first presented to me um, that the city was in need of community members to be on this committee, um, immediately it was something that, um, I, that I, I thought was important. Um, but I, if I can echo the sentiment from a couple of uh, introductions ago, when I toured the facility, um, it became less of a, yeah, I think we should do that, and more of a, we need to get this done yesterday. Um, <laughs> So I, I think that you know our, our officers deserve better and the city that they protect needs better. So I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to getting this process underway. Great, thanks, Jerry. Uh, Steve Pagram. Good afternoon, this is Steve Pagram, late Director of Emergency Management at Columbia County, um, soon to be working uh, at the state level in Oregon on a joint task force. Um, I'm just here because I'm the late emergency manager of Columbia County. I've got 30 years in emergency management. Look forward to working with you guys on the project because, yes, Chief Greenway and his team certainly need a, an improved facility. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Carmen. Hello, I'm Carmen Dunn. I am the chair of the Parks and Trails Commission, and I work full time for a healthcare organization as a senior business intelligence developer. Um, so I just wanted to join the committee as a voice from somebody in the community and try to lend my expertise in the data realm. Thanks, Carmen. Uh, Doug Treat. Well, good morning. As a graveyard guy, it's always good morning for me at this time of day. Uh, I'm currently, as of today, the uh, graveyard patrol sergeant. I have the unique perspective of having almost 27 years in law enforcement. Uh, six and a half in St. Helens from 2002 back down to 1996. Um, I spent 18 years with Lake Oswego Police Department and was involved in some of their uh, building plans for the new police department that they are, are currently building. So I have, have a little bit of a different uh, perspective and I'm excited to be on the panel. Thanks, Doug. Dylan. Yeah, my name is Dylan Gaston. Uh, I've worked with the city for about five and a half years now. Uh, my family and I moved out here about two and a half years ago. Um, I'm currently president of the St. Helens Police Association. Um, I feel very fortunate to work uh, work in a community with so much uh, support for law enforcement. So I appreciate all you guys and I look forward to uh, helping out however I can. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, Janine Norris. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Hi, guys. Um, let's see. We've been in the community about 13 years now um, in St. Helens from San Diego, California. Uh, we have three children. Um, I, I try to stay active in the community um, and in different aspects quietly. Um, 
Let's see. I'm very passionate about our community. I've um, been a part of the St. Helens, St. Helens School District Bond Committee for years now. And well, with COVID, it's kind of hard to stay active, but I've heard, I've been hearing about the police station needing help. And when I heard about this committee, I really wanted to lock arms with other like-minded individuals that want to basically see the community flourish and get what it needs. Great, thanks, Janine. Uh, let's see, Jeff Oxier. Hey, uh, Jeff Fox here. I am the Columbia County District Attorney. I work with St. Helens PD a lot, uh, putting cases together and uh, spent some time in the cinder block building personally and uh, excited to uh, uh, add my perspective and uh, uh, see if we can't make a building that lends itself to uh, uh, doing quality investigative work and uh, make a space that uh, St. Helens PD deserves. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jennifer Punsley. So um, I am uh, here as a City of St. Helens Planning Commissioner. I'm also on the Board of Directors of the Columbia County Museum Association, which is our local historic society. Um, I've been a real estate broker here for 26 years, and I recently did the renovation on the real estate building down on the plaza. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Jonathan Bouchard. You guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. So hi everyone, I'm Jonathan Bouchard. I'm the plant manager at Cascade Tissue Group here in uh, St. Helens. Um, why I'm interested in this project? Well, one, I think it's a great project and I think it's really needed. So, uh, you know, just thank you to Rachel and Keith for putting me on this. Anything I can do to help? Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Judy Thompson. Oh, hey, Judy, I think you're on mute. There we go. No, there we go. All right, excellent. Hi, everyone. Um, so longtime resident, a little over 40 years, and currently I, I've serve, I'm serving as NAMI chairperson for Columbia County. That's National Alliance on Mental Illness, and I serve on volunteering in quite a few different areas in our community to make lives better, and, and that's just um, been a real, real important, I don't know, a real passion of mine. And, you know, we, we so need a new police station like yesterday, like what folks are saying. And, you know, our officers need a safe place to work in. Our officers need to be taken care of. And, and the community growth that we're looking at is going to be really dy dynamic. And whatever we can do to make this new building and growth for the future is really, really, like, really needed. And on the tour, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. Some of the things I saw, I mean, like, there's no safety elements for pe the officers when they bring their things in, like confiscated material or however you say to examine. And but the one was where the little room, maybe it's an eight by eight with two officers share with a canine. <laughs> and the canine's got his little, you know, big ke portable kennel in there. It was like, I just was like, man, we we gotta do better for our guys and gals. So yeah, that's why I'm here. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Rachel yeah. Berry. Hello, thank you. Yes, I am Rachel Barry. I am the Government Affairs and Project Support Specialist for the city. This is an exciting project. Also raising a family here, absolutely all in in this community and looking forward to, to doing great things. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Scott Stockwell. Hi, I'm a born and raised St. Helens I, and I am super excited to join this team. I'm the superintendent of the public schools here in St. Helens. We enjoy an excellent relationship and partnership with the city and the police department. We've done a lot of work to support both. And I know working together, uh, you know, we have a stronger community with the school district in partnership with the city. And I feel like we've got a renaissance going on in St. Helens with the developments, not only um, the housing and apartments going up, um, the schools that we're building. So I'm excited to, to support our, our uh, police and our police station. So looking forward to the work. Thanks, Scott. 
All right, looks like we have a couple more people. Uh, George Dunkel. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, I had trouble getting the audio working, so I had to switch computers. Uh, but I did get to hear everybody. So anyway, uh, George Dunkel, I'm most recently, I guess you say, retired from Columbia River Fire and Rescue as fire chief. My connection with St. Helens is the nine years that I served the community. And, uh, and I saw this opportunity, did some visiting with some city folks and thought maybe I could offer something as far as as uh, public relations and, and the financing part. And anyway, nice to work with the new, new police chief. So he's still new as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, George. And I think the last person is Todd Jacobson. Yes, Todd Jacobson, Executive Director of Columbia Community Mental Health. And I'm just really vested in having, seeing law enforcement have the resources necessary to effectively do their job. Thanks, Todd. Did I miss anyone? I think I got everyone. Oh, my audio wasn't working if it's working now. Oh, Joe. Hey, it's working. All right. Introduce yourself. I'm Joseph Hogue. I'm a lieutenant uh, with St. Helens Police. I'm on my 23rd year. And like Keith Locke and Chris Iverson already spoke about, this is long overdue, but I think it's, you know, gotten to the point now where there are statutory requirements and changes that, you know, really, you know, we're just behind. We need the extra room and, and um, hopefully we can explain some of that a little bit later, but I'm glad to be here. All right. So just so you know, the meeting is going to be recorded. Uh, it, we're not on uh, Facebook or YouTube or anything, um, but the meeting will be recorded. If anybody did miss the meeting or wants to go back and watch it again, we'll have it available for you. Um, with that, I think we're going to hand it off to Rachel, who's going to go through just some uh, basic kind of agendas and meetings and a whole bunch of code of ethics and we should be done about nine o'clock. <laughs> I get all the fun stuff. <laughs> and Matt, if you wouldn't mind just screen sharing, I just wanted to, the chief did a really good job. I just wanted to outline the function of this committee. Oh, well, don't, you don't have to screen share yet then. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, chief did a good job. The main functions of this group are to solicit and share community feedback related to public safety, to be a champion for public safety. And we are talking kind of our public safety system. This is PD, but this is also our municipal court. So that's something to keep in mind. The idea for the facility to house them both, also potentially to be a backup emergency operations center and partner in other creative ways with the space. Um, Yes, the, one of the key functions of this group is to evaluate financing needs and mechanisms. And there's gonna be plenty more of that to come. And, and of course, you will be the group tasked with making a recommendation to our council as to, have to how to move forward seeking funding. Um, we appreciate your participation and would like it. Please come to the monthly meetings. They will be wonderful. <laughs> Please review meeting materials. We as staff commit to have those out to you at least a week in advance for your review. If you have questions, please direct them to staff. We're happy to provide any info um, or get you connected with experts, whatever we can do so that you feel well-informed, so that you are well-informed. Um, please be kind. Please you know, take direction from the chair at the close of this meeting, we will be you will be electing a chair and a vice chair to preside over meetings. And that's a key part in making the recommendation for there to be a chair. Um, these meetings, while they are not broadcast, they will be recorded and we do expect, you know, common courtesy in meetings. Um, there's not, well, we like civil discourse and if we can promote that at the local level, then we're doing a good job. Uh, and we will have minutes and of course recordings available for you. So that is, that's about it on roles and responsibilities. Are there any questions about that? Okay, hearing none, I'm just going to breeze through our code of ethics. Um, congratulations, if you weren't a public official at 359, you are now, well, actually, when council formed the group, you, you became a public official in service to the city of St. Helens. Many of you are public officials in your day jobs, but if, if you weren't, now you are. Um, and with that, of course, we have a commitment 
to, to uphold a standard of ethics. We hold our resources and trust to do the best we can for our community. Everything we do must benefit everyone. And when I say that, do you think about underserved populations? Do you think about everyone in the city that you come in contact with? It's very important that our decision benefits the whole. Uh, another point in our code of ethics is objectivity. Please do um, either avoid to the degree that you can or disclose conflicts. I'm sure that we will have conflicts of interest and that is fine. This is not to be feared in any way. If you have a conflict or a potential conflict, just disclose that. Uh, if, if necessary, refrain from the vote. But I, I think just looking at the makeup and thinking about the task at hand that we may not, we may not run into that. But if you do, not a big deal. Disclose any conflicts. Um, avoid bias and be as inclusive as possible. This is, we're going to be making merit-based decisions in the public interest, of course. Our third point is this accountability. And this comes, our council very wisely looking forward has adopted a strategic plan. A key piece of that is a new public safety facility. This appears in our plan. This is part of our accountability to the people that we serve. Um, and if you find there are any areas that could use improvement, please let us know. Let's work collaboratively toward improved process and better service. You also, we all have a, a role in leadership. It is to us to set the example. Back to that, I, we at the local level can create and, and continue high functioning government, civil discourse and a tone of respect. It's always good to have and needed now more than ever. Um, so that is my that is my ethics review. The I believe the full handout was distributed in the packet. If you have questions on any of these, please just give a buzz and we can we can explore it more. So thank you. And now Matt, you may screen share. We wanted to um, share a little bit about a community survey. And thanks to many of you who participated and helped to get this out to our community. There you go. Next slide, please. Here we see our mission and vision. And the vision is to provide quality, effective, and efficient services to our citizens. Role of the city, right? We would like to preserve, develop and preserve the highest possible quality of life. Think about the facility. Safe and healthy environment. Think about the facility. And leadership that's open and responsive to the needs of the community and working for the benefit of all. There you go. So yes, this survey, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pull out the police section to share with you all. Um, more results are available and they're fascinating, but this opened in January of this year. Also keep in mind, this was pre COVID time. So it ran January and February and it was distributed in any way we could think of. There was a note in our utility billing, there were web links, social media, email. I went to churches, we were, we were out. And also thanks to the senior center, they let us come and crash lunch one day. So really tried to get a broad representation. Did all right, standard numbers of respondents, about 5% of the population, which sadly is the standard response to a survey. The interesting thing though about three quarters of those respondents left comments. Shows that folks really do have a lot to say. Yeah, so go ahead, Matt. And uh, I just wanted to call this out because I think we got some really broad representation. We asked how many years people have lived here and it, it breaks down, it breaks down kind of equitably. Um, was really happy to get folks who are new to the community engaged. Also happy to have that engagement from folks who have been here for, for a long time. There you go, Matt, next slide. The other amazing thing was the diversity in age groups and how evenly represented folks were. This was quite shocking to me, but uh, we even managed to get some 19 to 24 year olds, um, but a really good, good cross section of age ranges represented there. 
employment and housing. We've got, you know, folks working full time, many, many folks. Also volunteers in the community, retired people, all of that. And the, the breakdown in housing really mirrors, mirrors the community, right? We've got a lot of single family detached, some attached. There you go, Matt. So here you go. What do you like most about living in St. Helens? Small town feel. You'll also notice the word safety. Safety was really important. And that feeling that people have that this is a great small town and safety is a big part of that. PD came out with the highest marks of really any of our internal city departments. This is just amazing. Over 91% of respondents have no negative feelings about the overall quality of police services. This was astounding to me because you usually don't interact with the police department on your best day. It was just really, really an amazing, an amazing thing. So yeah, Matt, moving on. And we broke down the comments a little bit further. I mean, we had a couple individual issues they were really overwhelmingly very positive. Uh, we also had a number of folks who called out the facility need. So there is that awareness out there. I think folks who have seen it or had occasion to be in, in the station know that that's a huge need. Yeah, really high levels of satisfaction and some of the highest are around those community events. Um, also visibility, police patrol. This community is really behind this, this department and it shows. Um, some of the places for improvement are kind of the hardest, right? Some of the enforcement, code enforcement, noise enforcement. That's a real personal personal thing and in many times a neighbor neighborly relations issue. Um, but it was really astounding. And moving forward, as we think about how we communicate and how we engage with the broader community, I just wanted to put this up here. Many folks have gone to the social media, as we know. Word of mouth is the tried and true. I know my neighbors ask me all the time what's happening in City Hall. Yours, yours may start to do that too. Uh, and the channels that, that we control per se are also a great source of information. We have people who actually read the newsletter and that doesn't always happen. Um, and also the power of our local print news sources was revealed here. So just something to keep in mind. All right, greatest challenges facing the city in the next 10 years. Safety also appears here very prominently. Managing growth, I mean, this is, this is what is happening. We are, our town is booming and to maintain and preserve safety is gonna be a great challenge for us. So. And from this, I have already mentioned, um, our council was really, really proactive and really wanted to know. And then we developed and adopted a strategic work plan for these two years. We are committed to accountability to our community. This info, if you, if you have free time and wanna hang out on our website, our, um, our action plan, our strategic work plan is up there with action sheets that are updated. We internally as staff are shifting our culture to better report and to better talk about and tell the story about the work that we do for our citizens. So I think that's about what I have to say. Here are the areas of our goals and a PD facility really fits into every one of them. You all, by virtue of being here, are part of an effective organizational structure, right? Broad benefit for our community. It, it really is, is for you and for everyone to engage. As seen in goal two. Oh, hang on just a sec. Safe and livable community. Really big. There you go. This really focuses on the mechanics of safety. And I know Chief has several goals that are housed under that goal three. This also has a clear tie to our economic development and shared prosperity as a city. And we now have this opportunity to think long-term and down the road. So thank you. Anybody have any questions for Rachel? 
Hey, Doug, you're on mute. I'm not sure if you're wanting to ask a question here or not. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yep. And we can chat more about it. We can chat all day long about strategic work plans and community service and engagement. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to quickly just do a quick presentation about the committee itself and what you can expect over the next couple months that we are going to be meeting. So obviously you're all well familiar with our current police station here. <clears throat> um, we are right now in the planning stages of a new public safety facility. Um, we're looking and hoping that in 2021 we will look at um, some of those financing options and hopefully for rec with a recommendation from this committee, we will move forward on those fundings, strategies, whatever those may be. And in a perfect world, uh, we would get those all sewn up in a nice little bow and start accepting money and move to the next stages of actually building the facility in 2022 or 23. Um, so that's kind of just a rough timeline to keep in mind. So in September was when the ad hoc committee was created by the city council, as most of you know. October's here, we're having our first meeting. We have a meeting scheduled in November and December. December is the last scheduled meeting that we have put on the calendar right now. Um, our hope is that we will go through as much information as we can and give you as many of the tools and information that you need to make an informed decision at this December meeting. And the hope is that the chair and vice chair from this committee will make a recommendation to the city council in January about how to move forward. So to give you a rough idea, we're obviously at this first meeting where we're Rachel just finished talking about city vision, mission, ethics, and the survey. Uh, Chief and I are going to talk about the site selection process, and then we do have some time at the end of the meeting for any kind of open discussion. We have some current officers here, as well as administration staff and myself and John, Rachel, um, and Joe, and Chief to answer any questions that might come up. And so we made sure to include some discussion time at the end of every single meeting. Um, in November, we'll really get into the actual finance discussion. We'll have somebody from a company called DA Davidson um, that specializes in public finance, whether that be um, bond or any other kind of financing options that we're going to look at. We'll also hear from uh, cities like Oregon City, who has just opened a new police facility and how they went through the funding process and their mechanisms. And then we'll also bring in McKenzie Architecture, who the city is working with right now on our current police station stands. So you'll get to see um, potentially what a rendering would look like, what the building site plan would look like, um, and we'll go into some more details and McKenzie and their architects will be available at this meeting to answer questions. Uh, that you may have. And then the third meeting in December, we'll kind of have an open discussion at the beginning about what recommendations the committee is thinking of or leaning towards um, and have any, uh, any questions and answer time for that in December. And then like I mentioned in January, uh, the hope is that this committee would make a recommendation in January to the city council. Any questions? None, all right. So I am going to pull up some slides here about our public safety facility site selection process. So Chief Greenway and myself are going to tag team this a little bit. And Chief, feel free to butt in whenever uh, you'd like. I know we have a couple slides that are specific to you. Uh, and uh, maybe if you want to talk briefly about kind of what you as a police department look for in a new site selection for a, for a police station. Right. So, uh, again, we touched on this. This is not just a police station. This is a public safety facility. And seeing how um, it's going to be kind of the on front street, if you will, for the city um, being uh, when it's built. And I'm being optimistic. I don't say if. I like to say when. Um, so I, uh, based on everything we've gone over with the public support and everything. Um, so you have to have a, a location that is um, conducive to continuing to provide the po best possible service to our public, um, be uh, accessible to our public, but also be kind of advertisement, so to speak, because it'll be a new facility and we want to we wanna kind of brag about it. We want it to be, you know, in the papers when it opens, we want to kind of our biggest competition to be uh, Mr. Scott uh, Stockwell's new high school, you know, the rival of that when that when that new um, um, the renovations are made. So 
but the overall of site selection is is based upon public safety needs. And one of the challenges of St. Helens that we're, we're, you're going to see a map here of our calls for service, uh, meaning where where the 911 calls come in the most, is we have uh, the trains that run right through the city of St. Helens. And I'm sure everybody on this meeting has been delayed by an oil train, any type of train, log train. Um, so. You know, the, the first argument was, well, do we, do we put it on the west side of the highway? Do we put it on the east side of the highway? How are we going to get around it? So that 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 site selection um, of where we can put our station came into play a lot. And honestly, the best people to know where a police station goes is the actual officers who are in and out of the station on a daily basis. Um, we had to get their way in to get their buy in. And so we went to the officers, our staff. Um, and you know our city leaders, our city council, and we kind of uh, roundtable it where to put it. So um, I'll touch on this again, but the site selection we did select, and Matt just pulled up the slide, the green dots are where in 2018, 2019, in the first couple months of 2019, where we asked CECOM to pull, where are the 911 calls in the city of St. Helens? And it's what we call a shotgun pattern. There's really no rhyme or reason of, you know, our, our, you know, it looks like we have the majority of calls if what you would call Old Town St. Helens, but you can't ignore the west side across 30. So the site selection where it's going now, um, um, OPR, Old Potent Road and Castor gives the officers the ability to uh, maneuver around any type of trains that might be blocking the, uh, the um, highway, you know, the, the access to Highway 30. I know uh, Mr. Dunkel and uh, working so many years with the fire, uh, Columbia River Fire Rescue, probably had the same encountered, you know, the trains, how do you get around them? Um, so that location would give us the uh, avenue to, um, you know, maneuver the oil trains. One good thing about wherever the police station go, and I know I speak this on behalf of everybody, we would all love to have a police station in our backyard. That's a fact. Um, property values are going to go up. Businesses are going to be attractive. You know, I don't want to get into too much of Matt's area here, but um, so I think that that location that we did select um, is going to assist us all the way around. So hopefully I didn't say too much, Matt, and steal anybody's thunder. So, No, you're good. I do also want to mention that this list of potential properties that we looked at was done internally through staff um, discussion and with city council discussion. Uh, city council ultimately selected uh, the final site once we went through with McKenzie and finally tuned our selection process. But by doing this internally and not having an architecture firm or um, some kind of third party company and coming in and doing all of this, um, save the city probably roughly about $25,000, $30,000 just for this site selection process, doing it internally. So I will go through and kind of give you a brief overview of each site that the city looked at. Um, and what some of the characteristics of why it was not chosen um, to move on or why it was. We initially kind of earmarked about 10 different sites around our community. And you can see by this map, we kind of divided them into sections between the west, south, industrial, central, east, and, and north sites. So I'm gonna show you each of these site selections and um, I'm happy to answer any questions and some of our other staff may be here to answer questions of why they thought that a site might not be the best suited for a new police facility. So first I'm gonna look at the uh, north sites, which we identified two potential sites for a public safety facility. The first is next to CC Ryder. Um, you'll notice CC Ryder is this little area up here. So we're talking about this property right here. Um, this potential site is not currently owned by the city. One of the key things that uh, I, we may talk about a little bit later today, if not uh, November for sure, is the desire and uh, want of the police station and the police public safety facility, apologize, um, is to be a one-story building. Uh, myself, Chief, uh, Lieutenant Hogue, a number of people have toured a number of public safety facilities around the state of Oregon with our architects and on our own as well. And one of the key points that at least was a big takeaway for me is that every facility was either a one-story building or if they built a two-story, they had wished it was a one-story building. So, and we can talk about that a little bit later in the open discussion. Um, so you'll see a one-story size potential here um, listed for each of these properties. Ultimately, this site selection was not uh, selected to move on 
as a favorite, um, mainly due to some of the potential site underground issues um, and the acquisition cost of actually purchasing the property. So the next site is um, actually kind of right across the street um, and it's a very weird shape, um, but it is partially owned by the city. So that is why we took uh, at least a look at it. Um, obviously for pretty obvious reasons, you can probably know why we didn't choose this selection. It's obviously a very awkward shape and would require the acquisition of a couple other neighboring properties um, that we did not feel at this time was um, in the means of the city to um, try and negotiate those, those uh, with those property owners on those properties. So um, this was not seen as a potential site for moving forward. On the west side, we looked at, we could really only internally find about one site that we thought might be considerable. Um, it is actually located right off Highway 30. Um, most of you know it as the Restore um, and this kind of multiple parcel properties um, right off of Highway 30. Um, ultimately, this site was not selected, uh, mainly due to the potential acquisition costs would be pretty high. Um, and also, as much as it may be nice to be right on Highway 30, there also are some disadvantages to being on Highway 30 as well. So that proved to be problematic as far as getting in and out um, of the police facility. So we looked at one particular site on the south side of Columbia or of uh, St. Helens, and that is the Millard Road property. Most of you probably have or know the history of this property um, and that it was uh, is now in the possession of the city of St. Helens is also known as the old hospital property. Um, this is a very inviting piece of land. It's nice and flat. There's no development anywhere. Um, but one of the key things that I think the city council discussed was its distance away from um, the heart and kind of center of the city. So being that far away, we didn't want to put a brand new police facility that was going to be this grand public safety facility out right on the outskirts of town. The other discussion I wanted to bring up here is that this property does also have the potential for um, housing and commercial properties as well. So that is potential property tax revenue for the city in that area. So we didn't want to be we didn't want to take that off of the tax roll um, for the potential future growth. So we looked at two sites near the industrials park. The first site is what is currently right now the recreation center. Um, the site is obviously owned by the city, um, and obviously if most of you, are, I believe, are familiar that the city owns pretty much everything um, from Old Portland Road off into the industrial park all the way to the river for the most part. So this is a pretty appealing property to look at for development as far as a public safety facility. Um, it definitely has the size potential that we needed, um, but we didn't, again, one, we went back to that future property tax revenue um, and the future plans for a possible industrial park um, that we are now master planning on. So it's actually good that we didn't pick the selection site because it's being involved in that master plan process for a future industrial park to hopefully bring in more businesses to the community. The next site though is right across the street. Uh, so this is the old Portland Road and 18th Street. Um, there's an apartment complex right up here. Uh, most of uh, you may be familiar with the bar that is right across the street. Um, so this is a kind of oddly shaped piece of property here um, that was kind of set forth back in the day. <laughs> and obviously the city owns it. Um, Owning all the land in the back of this property makes it very appealing for possible expansion in the future. Um, we never know where we're gonna be 10 years, 20 years down the road. So uh, whereas we may be planning a public safety facility for police and municipal court, it's very potential that we could move other offices and city offices to a building on that existing site. So the potential for expansion is really there. Um, our planning department did identify some floodplains that could be a potential issue when, when building. Um, obviously we have Milton Creek that kind of flows through here and there is some um, FEMA floodplains in this area that we have to address if this property is chosen. 
Matt, I just like, for the record, I just like to say that I am not familiar with that bar across the road, uh, Pastor Cummings. I just want you to know that. Um, I, Matt does not speak for all of us. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> okay. Wait, there's a bar there? <laughs> Um, a couple other things that uh, we'll talk about later on in this presentation is also the existence or non-existence of one-way streets. That was one thing that we heard from some of our officers was that at our current location, we have some one-way streets that go in and out. And it can be difficult sometimes for us to really need to go some way and there's a one-way street right there. So we have to go around a different way. Um, so that was taken into consideration when we were looking at this property as well. So on the east side of town, we did look at one site. Um, most of you know it as the old school. Uh, I believe a, a few of us actually toured the facility and did seriously talk about, um, actually, I think Jennifer, you were there uh, when we were at that tour because um, you wanted to see inside. So we got a very in-depth tour of this building. And as much as it has a lot of potential, it has a lot of potential to cost a lot of money. <laughs> so um, that was one of the downsides. Um, in addition to having to acquire the building as the city, um, it also has a lot of upkeep and uh, maintenance that has to be done to that building to become a public safety facility. Um, so because of those costs, um, it was decided not to move on with this property. In the central area, we did identify three sites. The first is obviously the current police station. Um, and we came up with two different options for this current police station. Um, as most of you know, the current police station kind of sits right here where my cursor is. And right now the city owns kind of an L shape right here. So we don't actually own this frontage of the building, which is right now the restore resale place. Um, the option one was to stick with the current foot print of the police station. The second option was to purchase the frontage here and that way we would have frontage to Columbia Boulevard. So this one, um, because we own the property and the potential for expansion into the frontage area um, with the second option of this square footage, um, we thought it was a viable location for to move forward to a final selection round. And then we have a 18th in Columbia, which is basically a square block um, that you can see right here. One of the advantages to this is owning the entire city block, um, but it, there is a purchase price for that. Um, one of the nice things was that it was centrally located in a place where we do wanna see development in the future. Um, it does allow street parking um, and the that's about it. <laughs> so uh, this property was decided to move on to kind of the next phase. Um, the other property here is at 15th and Columbia Boulevard. There are about five or six different parcels in this little block area right here. Some of you may recognize this building as the old feed store. It's now going to be the future uh, Columbia feed store. So it will still feed people, um, but that will be the future food bank. So um, the idea was to purchase the remaining parcels of this city block and put a public safety facility in this spot. Um, ultimately, this was decided not to move forward, mainly because I believe it was six different parcels that the city would have to purchase um, that it did not feel that would kind of live up to what we would like. So those were the 10 sites that we initially looked at internally. Um, ultimately, we decided on a kind of a top three choice, uh, which was the vacant site at Industrial Park that was that weird shape. Uh, the current police station with the second option of purchasing the frontage to Columbia Boulevard, and then the entire square block of 18th and Columbia. So once we got to that point, that's when we brought in McKenzie Architecture. So McKenzie Architecture is a firm out of Portland that has done uh, numerous facilities. And we brought them in at this stage saying, we have kind of a top three list and we need some help just finalizing for ourselves and city council about what we believe the final choice should be. And McKenzie Architecture is well 
versed in public safety and public facilities. Um, they have, in their previous jobs, have done Sandy, Albany Police Station, Bonnie Lake, Washington, uh, Bainbridge, Westland, Vancouver. So a number of public safety facilities specifically. Um, specifically working for the city of St. Helens, they have worked with our parks department um, on doing master plan pictures for Godfrey Park and Campbell Park. Uh, Campbell Park was one, if you don't, or if you're not aware, the city received a very sizable matching grant from the state to redo uh, the basketball courts, tennis courts, and the parking in that park. So um, that was in no part in help with Mackenzie for providing those graphics and pictures to help kind of put the story into a really nice picture that we got that grant for. So we are very well versed in working with Mackenzie in the past and we're excited to work with them for this new police station. So with their history of Mackenzie, they have outlined in their process about 18 different characteristics of a public safety building that they look at when they're reviewing sites. Um, you can see that list here. I'm not going to read them off one by one, um, but it's um, a very well-versed list and one that they had three architects go through our site selection process. We also had our internal staff um, go through this characteristic list and rate each of the final three sites to see who would kind of come out on top. So a couple of those final three, I wanna remind people is the 1771 Columbia Boulevard. So this is that entire square block that we would purchase. This was probably the second one on the list, number two. And one of the main reasons it was number two is having to do with this sanitary sewer line that runs right through the middle of the property. Um, I'm sure as uh, Jennifer and, and Russ are well familiar, uh, we can't really build a building on top of our sewer line. So um, doing a one-story building on this property um, was basically not an option. So we, we did play around for a little while on a two-story building. And in the midst of going through that process, we continued to go look at other sites. Um, and we just continually heard that if you can do a one story, stick to a one story. Um, and so that ultimately kind of helped knock this building out of the top contention um, just for that sole purpose of really just trying to build a one story facility. So the other one was the current police station. Um, and this is that frontage area that we would purchase and then we own Obviously this is the current police station right here. So we have a somewhat similar issue with this um, on this property as well. Ultimately in the rating process of the characteristics from McKenzie, um, it was ultimately decided this was actually number three out of three on the list. So that brings us to the number one choice um, internally from staff as well as city council decided to move forward, which is the old Portland Road and Castor Road property. Um, so there are no current easements on the property. Um, like I mentioned earlier, our planning department has identified some floodplain uh, lines that we have to work with FEMA on um, and through our building process to um, kind of make everything work, but it is definitely doable. So the city has decided to kind of move forward with this property at Old Castor Road and or Old Portland Road and Castor Road. Uh, Chief, did you want to talk about this property a couple minutes? And yeah, um, so just to kind of touch on what Matt had said about the one story compared to two story and uh, the cost effectiveness of a two story. For instance, you need an elevator. Elevators are extremely expensive. Um, two weeks ago, we just toured uh, Lincoln City Police Department. They have a brand new station. Their elevator is not even in service. Um, and uh, it was and then it's broken. Um, so there, it's very it's not cost effective. Um, this property here, like I mentioned earlier, this gives the officers the opportunity to uh, traverse both the uh, Highway 30 being through McNulty, you know, OPR to McNulty, um, to Highway 30 in, in, a, in a true emergency uh, to bypass the trains. I know there's been talk about possibly an overpass, but let's be honest, uh, in our lifetimes, not to be funny, we probably will never see that. Just It's just not cost effective. I think we have a better chance to see a bridge to Washington, St. Helens before an overpass across Highway 30. Um, in addition, this, this property here um, allows for the police department down the road um, to possibly expand. Um, one thing we're gonna touch on later is that we cannot build this police station for today's specifications. 
Um, we have toured two out of six police stations that the chiefs have expressed to us. They, they didn't plan well enough when, and meaning when they opened the door, they were at full capacity. They had no room to grow. Um, so what I'm, my whole point in this is that it, this property uh, give, affords 40, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, who knows what St. Helens is going to look like. I have my own personal ideas of being a, a residential bedroom community to, to Portland, just like Scapoose. But again, that's just, you know, I have nothing, um, no, no empirical data to say that, just my own beliefs. It's just going to, you know, grow like a weed on steroids. So our, our children, our grandchildren, we owe it to them to, you know, make sure we, we build a, a facility that can be, you know, expanded if needed um, uh, down the road. So that's, that's, you know, the best choice. And, uh, when it comes down to dollars and cents, the city owns this property. Um, the other, the other properties, um, you know, full disclosure were expensive and, you know, God forbid, if the word got out that a city government was going to purchase the land, well, we probably double the cost of it because, you know, everybody thinks that the city of St. Helens or whatever city it is across America that they can, uh, you know, not saying they would price gouge or anything, but that, you know, you can't ignore it either. So, um, again, I go back to the officers, the, the boots on the ground, so to speak. They, uh, they really uh, believe that uh, this was the place to be. Um, it's, it's, it's accessible to the public. It could be our showcase piece of uh, the city, but at the same time, um, number one priority is serving the public in the best cap uh, capacity we can. So hope that helps. So that was the presentation on the site selection process. And we wanted to kind of open it up. I know we're just a little bit behind schedule, but uh, we do want to open it up for general questions. Um, so this is either for, if you want to ask a question of our administration staff, to our chief, um, to Rachel, who you spoke earlier, um, any of our current officers that are on, um, any questions or thoughts that you might have initially as we- Matt, kind of Matt before we- Matt, I didn't mean to cut you off. Could I just go over some speaking points just to kind of explain, or is this the wrong time to do that? No, that's absolutely a great. Okay. Yep. So I just want everybody to understand where we're coming from, from the police side of the house. So as I mentioned, we have toured um, six different facilities across Oregon. Um, some on our own from Sandy, Utah to Lincoln City, Oregon City, Sherwood, Westland, fantastic uh, police facilities that were recently built. Um, what we started um, gleaning from these visits is not what to do, but what not to do, which was really of the takeaways from these visits, um, which really is going to uh, benefit our community. Um, it's just, you know, the first and foremost, any takeaway is to um, build it for the future. Don't build it for now. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, you know, there could be people say, oh, this isn't the right time or this isn't the right, you know, or the, the economy. Um, if, you know, if we wait five or 10 years, uh, you know, not to be funny, we shoot ourselves in the foot because the cost will just continue to increase. Um, so I'm just going to touch on, again, not to get in the weeds on this, but the benefits of a new station. And Joe Hogue was asked to join this meeting tonight. Everybody knows Joe Hogue. Joe Hogue is, uh, is, is the face of the uh, St. Helens Police Department. Um, he's the best looking, I think. So uh, he should be the face of it. But Joe is a local historian and just in casual conversation, Joe and I had spoke, Joe informed me, well, he's been on, as he said, 23 years on this police department. Joe has seen in 23 years, close to 35, if not more, new hire officers get hired by the city of St. Helens and then ultimately leave. It costs folks $87,000 to train a police officer. So just doing the simple math, I'm an Illinois public school system graduate, so bear with me. Three million dollars the city has spent in, in 23 years just on training alone that has come and walked out the door. So this new public safety facility is not just so our officers can do a better job, but it's also to attract, retain, retain and train the best officers we can possibly do. It is no secret what's going on across our nation. Anti-police sentiment, uh, pro-police sentiment, regardless of your, your, how you sit on the fence. But we, are ch we face the challenge, started about 10 years ago, in recruiting officers for this job. Now that challenge has been elevated to a point where I'm actually, for the first time, nervous. How are we going to recruit to have officers 
to protect the city and not only recruit the best possible officers, but retain them as the three million dollars that Joe can attest to walked out our door. So this this public safety facility is going to help our community in more ways than just a, a, a facility that we can use for our officers to be housed in. Um, we don't have the ability right now to be accredited by the Oregon Accreditation Alliance. Um, we just don't. Our facilities now, um, and, you know, and, and again, it makes me nervous because we don't have a place to, to, that I feel safe enough where the officers can impound uh, the evidence they need to impound and maintain a safety. My first month here, I witnessed an officer impound fentanyl and have 15 minutes later eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at the same table. Folks, that is, that's unbelievable. I'll just tell you that right now that, it, you know, fentanyl will kill you if, in, if it's ingested. Um, but our officers deserve better. They are, you know, 70% uh, of our department are residents of this community. They deserve better. Um, and so that's my, my, my plea to everybody. And uh, again, my, my thanks to everybody with the passion to make this happen. Um, but don't lose sight on this is not just a police station like at Matt and Rachel have touched on. This is a public safety uh, facility that's gonna house our municipal court. It's gonna house possibility our city council if they decide that they wanna use the dais for uh, their meetings. This is gonna house our community room that's, that's going to be our, our community's room the public can come and have a safe space to hold meetings in a community room with state-of-the-art audio visual um, uh, you know facilities and technologies and a restroom that they can use it's not just a police station in fact we're going to house those community events that our public has so uh, gave us high marks for they'll be housed out of uh, our you know this public safety facility it's going to be an emergency operations center in case the county steve pegram's here in case we can't use their their uh, facility, um, who knows what, what the future, you know, floods, this big cascade earthquake that nobody told me about before I relocated up here to, to this, the Pacific Northwest. And I'm the guy, yeah, that's me. Wait, what about this earthquake that nobody seemed to tell me about before I accepted this position? Um, you name it, it could be a backup emergency operations center. Lincoln City Police just did it with the wire fire, fires that, the, you know, that the county, their county, um, was faced with it. Uh, we're in talks with Columbia County 911 of possibly housing a backup communication system there, where if the power goes out at CECOM, they can now dispatch out of their out of our facility. So it's it's very multifaceted of why we need this. But I just you know before we we start asking questions and everything, I just want you to know as a group that um, I'm confident to say that staff. The elected officials and the residents have done their due diligence on the site location. We definitely know there's a need for this facility. Um, I'm almost pleading with the public um, because we we just need another tool in our on our tool belt to recruit and you know to attract, recruit, and and, and, and retain the officers because we are fighting across the and I only say the state of Oregon, the United States to get officers. Nobody wants to be a police officer anymore. And as shallow as this may sound, it could be a decision that they come out because, hey, St. Helens has a, a, a new police facility. Um, you know, it's almost like when you bought your first house, when you moved out of an apartment, or for me, when I moved out of my dad's basement and, uh, and got my first apartment, um, I was excited. And, and you know, I, and so anyway, I'm sorry for my diatribe, please. Uh, I'm glad for you bearing with me. And I guess we can open up, Matt, like you said, I just wanted to speak from the heart that we're desperately in need of this. Your officers, uh, the men and women of the St. Helens Police Department work day in and day out tirelessly to keep this community safe. And we owe it to them to give them the best possible facility so they're not eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at the same, in the, even in the same area that they're impounding a life altering, life killing drug. It's just, we, we're, we can do better than that as a community, as community leaders. So thank you for, the, for listening to me kind of go on. Thank you, Chief, that was great. Okay. So we'll open it up the, to the floor for any questions that uh, anybody may have. And I, I have a couple questions. Um, is, is this property, I, I agree fully with the Castor Road property. I think that just is a no brainer uh, based on everything you've shown us, but is this property zoned appropriately? That I'm gonna direct that to our uh, 
planning director and Jacob Gratian uh, and say that he has been well versed in the discussions and property site selection. Um, and if a zoning change is needed, that can be done um, pretty easily. Okay. And also, do you know if a level one's been done on that site? And also, I, I remember as a kid, there used to be houses over there before there was sewer systems uh, in place. So I know that there's probably abandoned septic systems on that piece of property. And but any property has challenges, but I just want to make sure everybody's aware of all that before they you know, start breaking ground and then get surprised. Oh yeah, no, there's definitely some due diligence that we're kind of in the second stage right now of doing that due diligence. <clears throat> We've done an initial kind of site plan, an idea of where the building may be placed, how it's going to look, where the public parking, where the secured parking is going to be. Um, and once we get that um, kind of nailed down and agreed upon with everyone, then uh, it kind of moves to that next stage of actually going in and looking at the site specifically with a with an estimator and, and talking about all those options. So we, ha we haven't got there yet, Chris. Okay. <laughs> Judy, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, here we go. Um, so we're talking about the cost of the structure of the building. What about all the good stuff that's going to go in the building? Is that going to be part of the initial re budget request or funding? Yes, it is. It would be part of the entire ask of, of the cost of the, of the facility. Okay. So all the furniture and chairs are, are all included. All the tech stuff, yeah. all the good stuff. Okay. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, I think the site location is brilliant, by the way. <laughs> I love it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, even though you speak about um, being a single level, or is there any plans to put a basement in for potential expansion? It seems like that may be a consideration. You know, I don't think we've actually talked about putting in a basement in that area. Uh, mainly, I think what has driven that is the floodplain issues that we're running into right now. Um, so I know we're working with FEMA. Our, the architects, Mackenzie, brought up a really interesting point on the floodplain that was done there many years ago by FEMA. Um, in not so many words of our architects, it kind of defies gravity, literally. Uh, the FEMA plan does. So uh, our Mackenzie is working with Jacob, our city planner, um, to start those discussions with FEMA about um, how we need to redo the plan um, for that specific area so that we can make it feasible for a police facility. My other thought, I find it really interesting, Chief, that you talk about uh, recruitment because as I was touring the facility, I was thinking this is really not a happy place to work. There's like one or two windows um, the other things that stood out to me was accommodating uh, women police officers, uh, getting them ready for shift, sharing those spaces. Um, it was also brought to my attention that there are times where you might have the victim and the uh, alleged assailant in this close proximity, which I find incredible. Um, and then the uh, two safes that were in the garage where they store their long guns. Uh, and the one padlock that is on their ammunition storage. So uh, I had a short career as a military police officer in the 70s. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that part was just astounding to me. So we really need this facility. We do, thank you. And if you haven't gotten a chance to tour the facility, um, Jose Castilla, who's one of the sergeants, um, is available to schedule that, inter that um, tour anytime that you would like. If you haven't been over there recently, um, even if you know the police station and you've been a longtime resident, I really encourage you to actually go inside and talk with the officer and, and go through that tour to see what these issues that Jennifer and a number of other people who have toured the facility are talking about. Um, to give you an idea, just in, in reference, it's about 2,200 square, square feet. Um, so that's a lot, sometimes usually smaller than the house that we live in. We're very fortunate. You, everybody's seen the trailer that was next door. Scott Stockwell was very generous with the school district and donated that trailer. Um, so believe it or not, without our partnership with the school district, we, you would have four or five more bodies in that station. I mean, you know, again, I'm not trying to paint this grim picture, but that's a reality. So that, that, uh, 
that modular trailer was donated by the school district. We're very thankful for that, Scott. And we're ready to give it back to you. <laughs> Um, Go ahead. This is Diane Dillard. Working at Boise, we at one time uh, invited kinder care or kindergarten uh, to have a dependent workplace uh, child care center there. And we got some permits. We got going. So there's been a lot of look at architecture, basements for that area. So I think it's an excellent site. And uh, we might, I remember Keith knows that our employees needed childcare, work and shift work down there. And we got kinder care to come in and the city worked with us. Uh, Dave Albin was engineer at the time. So I would say that there's some work been done already that might even help you guys. Yeah, I, I'll definitely write that down. Thanks Jennifer and, and Diane for those comments. Um, but I'll definitely write down a basement in, in that will definitely give us some more options to look at when we're really looking at the facility. Matt? I do have a question if you've got time. Yeah, Erin, go ahead. Um, Chief, I know we're probably gonna talk about this in our next meeting, but I was, if we've got a little time today, could you maybe give us um, kind of your, your picture wish list about the new things that are gonna be it, specifically for the for the police that are going to be involved in the new building, uh, what we're going to be trying to design in, things you don't have now or that will improve. And part of why I'm asking you to do that now is that I look at this room and all of us here, and part of what we're here to do, as I see it, is to go out into our communities and start telling this story. And so we, you know, and, and again, I'd love, if you haven't taken the tour, please go take the tour. Um, it's, it really just makes it so obvious that this is, this is a mission we need to move on. And um, I, for one, don't want to, I, I, this has got to happen fast, people. It doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum. Um, this is, this is about our, our community and doing the right thing. So Chief, can you tell us what you're looking yeah. for? So really quick, uh, Jennifer actually touched on a little bit. We're looking for uh, a safe spot for our, our employees to work where there's plenty of room. Um, you know, and I'll just start off with the front lobby when you come in. There's really no area to for a, a victim of a crime or anybody reporting any crime to have confidentiality um, to talk to a person, um, you know, uh, uh, and take a, a report. Um, so it starts there in the front lobby. There's nowhere for them to actually sit down and, and write a statement or uh, a what, there's no seats in our front lobby. I mean, there's just nothing there. Um, it's so small. And then as we move through the station, the op professional office space, um, you know, uh, Judy had touched on it. We have an office that's shared by two, in, two supervisors and a canine dog. Well, one thing that, you know, everybody uh, in police work, we hold our officers accountable. And sometimes we have to have closed doors meetings and go over performance reviews. And, and we just don't have the space to do that. I mean, you know, we're asking, hey, um, you, can you take your dog for a walk while I talk to this employee who's now, you know, so it's just not professionally, it's not conducive to a professional environment. To evidence storage, um, I jokingly say, if you tour the station, you have to take one of those found bicycles as a consolation gift, you know, it, uh, <laughs> with you. Um, to, to, to proper evidence storage, uh, you know, Mr. Dunkel, close your, close your ears. To are we within fire code of our ammunition? Um, you know, the garage, the break, there's just, it just, the, the list is never ending. Um, the, again, I, I just say with, when we have officers, they don't even have the room to impound evidence properly. And that we don't have, you know, the ventilation hoods to, uh, we do the best we can. I mean, and we, we, you know, but the reality is, is that we do it at a, at a, cost to the officer's safety, the employee's safety is what I'm, I'm saying is then they, they deserve better. Um, proper evidence storage, a community room for the, for the community. Um, we would rather have, you know, be able to, Joe and I, Lieutenant Hogan and I talked today, we would love to have a citizen's police academy where we could showcase what the police, now more than ever, because a lot of people don't really understand what the police do. Um, they only see the media. Um, so we would love the opportunity to have a facility where we can showcase what, what the police do. 
um, and what you what we do for our community residents and they can come here we can have a citizens police academy we can talk about possibly a police commission um, but right now we are not in that position um, and it, it's it's all systemic because of going back to recruiting retention uh, you know we just can't seem to keep the people here and this is just another tool like I said before so we do have plans that are uh, uh, drawn up, uh, preliminary plans, more office space, conference rooms, um, restrooms, locker room. This was just a great takeaway that we, we've learned. Uh, it's not cost effective to have a male and female locker room anymore. Um, it's cost effective to have a locker area and then have individual changing rooms. So that, uh, that you know, almost like a bathroom uh, with the shower stall and a seat and a, a toilet in there. So instead of having a you know a traditional, well, there's the male locker room, there's the female locker room. Well, now the locker room shared, nobody changes. You just get your gear out of locker and you go into one of four rooms where you would then change in that room. Um, so there's a lot of progressive changes that we're learning that we can bring here. Um, you know, instead of knocking on the door, because we do have uh, female employees, you know, we have male employees changing the locker room. Um, we're just one door, turn away from, you know, getting ourselves in some hot water we don't want to be in. And not to be funny, but I wish, you know, so today I walk in the back of the police station, there's a cabinet that fell off a door. And so Dylan, who's there, I what happened to the cabinet? Oh, we were sitting here and it fell off. That's how, I mean, you just can't script the same, it, nobody shut the door, it just fell off. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's comical, but it's not, I mean, at the same time. So, um, I just, just leave it as I told him, don't duct tape it like we normally would. So, um, all right, we wouldn't duct tape it. But, so. I mean, hopefully, Aaron, that answered your question. But, uh, you know, again, I sure will get into it of what we need and, and the flow of everything. Um, but again, I, you know, again, I stress this and I should probably not say it again, but it's a, it's a public safety facility that our community is going to enjoy. We just own probably 75% of that building and we're the champion of this building along with all of you. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I had just one one thing to add, if I could, real quick. Uh, you know, to what the chief was talking about. I, you know, Chris Iverson's here, obviously, and and I think he can talk a little bit about the liability issues that are associated with storing um, evidence and found property as well. There's just simply a lot of of money in your your evidence room, and um, just you know, in the time I've been in law enforcement. As we know, there's just different requirements for training, and that's you know usually not synonymous with less square footage. That's just the, the cold hard truth. Uh, I think a couple summers ago, when we had not not to get into too many gory details, but when we had a double shooting, um, we had to have a young female uh, juvenile at our office, and, and we needed the the area to be able to you know kind of take temporary custody of her and. Um, provide her with services and, and get a statement from her. And that's one of those areas where it, it may not sound like a big deal, but you, we had her in a briefing room that the officers use. And that's really not the best place for a female juvenile who's um, you know witness to a, a horrific crime. So, well, maybe we'll use someone's office. Also not the best area for that. So what the chief's talking about, and I'll, I'll piggyback on that is you just simply can't have one catch-all room and these facilities that we're, we've been touring they're specific rooms you know that have a a purpose you may not use them every day but you know when it comes up you really need those areas and that's that's a lot of what you know we knew we needed it um, but when we started touring other areas and and saw what most of the agencies are doing around Oregon and what they're able to do is is you know why we're we're pushing this so hard and Aaron, I'll just uh, let you know that at the next meeting in November, we will be going through and showing you the site plan um, and potentially the floor plan as well. So yeah, you'll I, see what those rooms look like and how it's laid out on the property. Yeah, I figured. Um, but again, part of my, um, I look at part of my job here is to start talking to community members. And so it's very helpful to get uh, the chief's words and to reinforce what I saw. Um, but this is this is how we make sure that everybody in our circles know that this is what we need to do next. Yeah, and definitely as we continue talking, we will definitely put those to 
words to paper so that you have those talking points readily available for you. Um, I believe Jerry Cummins had a question. Yeah, first of all, I want to say that um, the, the amount of uh, time that Matt and uh, Jose at the police station have been able to give to uh, the members of this committee so that we, we just have some idea what we're talking about when we are talking to our neighbors is greatly appreciated. They've both been very gracious to me and I'm sure to everyone else. Um, you know, one of the conversations that I had with someone recently was uh, where they were asking why we need to spend millions of dollars on a new uh, public safety facility. And I asked them, um, have you ever been in the police station? And the answer was no. And I said, well, do you know what the, uh, the attorney room, the interrogation room and the uh, victim interview room all have in common? And the answer is, of course, it's the same room, basically. Um, it's, there, there aren't that many spaces to do things. Um, and, um, but I'm wondering, after meeting uh, with Matt, and, and he was very open and very transparent about the process, we're looking at spending you know, a certain amount of money, finding ways to capitalize that. Um, but are we not looking far enough into the future? Um, you know, if we look at where the city will be in 10 years, 15 years, um, but this, the department we have now is 50 years old. And, you know, one thing I learned, and I'm sure uh, Scott will find this amusing, but one thing I learned uh, as a part of a school board is it's easy to save your way into bankruptcy. Um, you, you think that you're being, you're being a good steward by not spending money today, but it ends up costing, you know, uh, just incredibly more later. Should we be looking at let's build a facility for where we expect the city's growth to be in 50 years, as opposed to 10 to 20 years, or at least build the outside of the building with space to grow inside so that, you know, because it's, it's a lot cheaper to go in and, and, uh, and develop, you know, large empty spaces than it is to build another building uh, or expand a building out back. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that's something the chief or Matt or John would wanna jump in on. So I'm just throwing that out to whoever from the city wants to respond. I could probably jump on first and then Chief and John are welcome to jump on the jump on the bandwagon. So through McKenzie, we did go through a process of a needs assessment, and that was with every single officer and our administration staff as far as where we think we are right now as far as staffing, <clears throat> as well as where we think we're going to be in 10 and 20 years. We did not go as far out as 50 because um, that gets a little bit more fuzzy, so to speak. Um, we tend to try and build with that 20, 30 year in range um, with the hopes that we will have some continued space to grow. Um, so we definitely did put that into our thought process of our, the facility that we're going to show you at the next meeting as far as our spacing and plans and potential growth for the future. One of my takeaways from my conversation with Jose is that we really don't have a large enough staff right now for the for the uh, for the city that we have. Um, and so, the, I mean, even immediately, if we hired the officers we need to hire, they would, you know, they would be uh, working outside in the yard because there wouldn't be any place to put them. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're not, you know, we're not going to be 10 years from now with another ad hoc committee trying to figure out where to put guys. <laughs> That's great. And the and this committee will get a copy of that needs assessment so you can see what staff has put together um, and what we see as the future internally. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to comment on that. Matt, can I bring up a point that kind of drives that home? Um, when I was at Lake Oswego, we had McKenzie come out and we were looking at a standalone police department. The needs assessment for that was 38,000 square feet for 78 employees. That police department ended up getting wrapped into City Hall. And so the police department is now 18,000 square feet for 78 employees and is at capacity the day it opens up in February of next year. So if we don't plan ahead, if we don't plan for 40 and 50 years down the road, we're going to be doing this all again in five years, 10 years, and, and we're going to be busting at the seams again. So just, just something to think about for the future. Yeah, and that echoes with uh, Lincoln City. Their original plan was 24,000 square feet. They opened at 16,000 and they've outgrown it and they've been in there two or three months. They're, 
they're already trying to rearrange furniture. Um, and again, like it's been said, but they're stuck with that. Jerry, just like you said, they are stuck with that. And the chief admitted, we are stuck with this building. We cannot go back to the public and ask for more money. So they're just gonna have to do work around. So, but great well, point. The thing is, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. The thing is, even if you can go back, it costs more to go back Yes, later. you're 100% right. Because right, construction time. costs go up and yes, I agree. Yeah. I did want to mention in the comments, Carmen had a couple questions um, that I, I believe are probably directed to uh, the chief. Uh, can you describe the current number of staff for the PD and how many people are on duty on at a time typically, as well as what the estimates are for what it could be like in 10 years and beyond? Right. So currently, Carmen, just so everybody knows, we, at a, we have a minimum staffings and we're one of the only agencies in Columbia County that always has two officers on. We're the only agency that offers 24 seven police protection in uh, Columbia County. Um, I can only speak for St. Helens, but I do know that we just uh, revisited that issue within the last 30 days um, staffing. Um, so in a perfect world, as everybody knows, police, the police profession is very dynamic at times. And um, so in a, in a perfect world, you should have uh, a supervisor on shift at all times. Um, and the reason that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get to this model is because a supervisor has a different role than a police officer. Although they can act in that capacity, the main purpose of having a supervisor there is to have somebody to take a, a almost like a 30,000 feet view and not be, um, you know, injected into the call and they can make sure everything's going away. And that's why we have supervisors. We all have some type of supervisor. Well, it's a boss, a spouse, whatever. We all, we all answer somebody. Um, so for Keith Locke, he's his own boss. Um, just, <laughs> so anyhow, so um, that's where we're at right now. Um, technically we have 11 patrol officers, um, four sergeants, one corporal, a lieutenant and chief. Um, we are understaffed greatly. Joe can speak to, they did a staffing study uh, years ago that we would need 26 officers um, to be, you know, for, for the current size of St. Helens, uh, just under 14,000, give or take. Um, but everybody, you know, uh, Jerry, to your point, you know, we have new apartments coming in to St. Helens. Um, it seems to be the housing market is cheaper out here. So um, I, I do believe that we're, we're on the cusp of uh, seeing a population increase. Scapoose is going to have uh, new apartments coming up um, by the uh, Goodwill store there and the Les Schwab. So, um, you know, in my vision in 10 years is to have uh, one, uh, a supervisor on at all times, 24 seven, who is actually a supervisor and at a, you know, bump that minimum up to three. Right now, we're just treading water. And what I mean by that is St. Helens is a very busy community. It's the busiest uh, city in the, in the county. And so our officers spend the majority of their time answering 911 calls, what we call calls for service. So there's very limited time for them to be proactive. Um, again, proactivity policing reduces crime. It is a proven academic fact that proactivity policing reduces crime. Now, proactivity policing doesn't mean arresting everybody. It just simply means being in the community, being visible, um, not being tied down in the station, writing reports or, or doing details. It's proactivity. Proactivity could be anything from talking to some kids, you know, playing basketball to arresting a bad guy. Um, but that is a proven fact back from the early 1900s that that actually reduces crime. That's my vision is to get uh, officers on to get enough that we can have proactivity and address the crime problems before they surface into more crime problems. It's a broken windows theory. Um, if, for those of you who don't know, if you have a broken window in your neighborhood and it goes unfixed, more crime will seep in over time. And pretty soon you got a dilapidated neighborhood. We don't want that in St. Helens. We want to address issues when they're minor before they, they become a major issue. So um, the goal is to have, you know, a full cadre of eventually get to right now. Our goal is to get to where we don't have our sergeants acting as a patrol officer. Our staffing levels are low right now meaning that there are a shift, like tomorrow day shift, we could have one patrol officer and one patrol sergeant working. And what that means is we just, that sergeant no longer holds, the, he, he kind of wears two hats or she wears two hats. Now they're an officer on a call and now they're a supervisor. Well, it kind of, it goes against the purpose of having a supervisor because they're wrapped up in the call instead of being there to oversee and make sure that we're doing things right. And what that does is that reduces our liability. It just makes for overall better policing. So. 
that's what we're looking at in for 10 years. But like I said, staffing studies at this time, I don't know, Joe, was it five years ago that they said we needed 26 officers? We have 11. You know, we have around like 18 with, uh, you know, full, you know, with, with the supervisors and everything. So you can see we're understaffed and this plays into a recruiting tool, a retention tool, um, you know, down the road. So hopefully I was able to get you. Okay, thank you. Um, I do see a question from Dave Inesetti. Uh, will the current police station property be sold after the new facility is finished or will it just be held by the city in their portfolio? Um, I know, John may want to speak to this a little bit, but I can probably start the conversation. Um, we haven't had firm discussions about what to do with the current police station once a new facility is chosen. I know there's a number of options, but I believe the current makeup of the city council is to not try and hold properties in a portfolio. And um, that is potential property tax revenue, business revenue, um, homes, commercial, whatever the zoning may be in that area. Um, but that could be a recommendation from this committee to, um, for the city council to consider that as they move forward. John, did you want to mention anything about that? Oh, I would just say that as, as part of, a, I think you just queued it up there perfectly as far as a recommendation on, you know, things that have value that could be put towards the construction of a police station. And that, that property is potentially one of them. And it's not just that property, that property goes the, most of the block there along the church too. So it's bigger than it looks, but there hasn't been any official discussions one way or the other about it at this point. So as far as the council's concerned. So I do wanna be cautious of everybody's time. I know we did say we would end at 5.30. Uh, the last thing on the docket was to recommend a chair and vice chair for this committee. Um, I'm not sure if uh, any of you are ready to make any recommendations for somebody that you see on the screen or um, that you saw earlier. I know we lost a couple of people in the process of the meeting um, that may have had other obligations. Um, is there anybody that would like to make a recommendation for a chair or vice chair? I would recommend Chris Iverson. I'll second that. I, I have a I have a problem though I I have a direct conflict um, that I need to disclose because I'm the insurance agent I'll assuming I'll be insuring the new building so uh, I'm not sure if I should serve as chair or not uh, leave it leave it to you guys. Chris, you want me to answer that? Yeah, George, I, I'd like <laughs> input on it. Uh, <laughs> There's no conflict for simply serving on a recommend committee like this. I don't, I don't see one anyway. Nice try, Chris. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Hold on, let me think of one more thing. Uh, <laughs> I'm here in a train, Chris, just so you know. <laughs> What's that, George? I'm here in a train whistle, just so you know. Yeah, I, the train's on the track. And, uh, <laughs> okay, I, I would do it if, uh, unless somebody else wants to raise their hand. Anybody? <laughs> so Matt, we also need a second, right? Uh, yeah, it's nice to have a vice chair as well, just in case Chris is not able to make it to one of the meetings or um, do something. Uh, I'd like to recommend George Dunkel as vice chair. <laughs> well, he, yeah, thanks. We'll keep <laughs> the train's still on the track. <laughs> yeah, I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any problem with that, and I definitely support uh, what the chief has brought up and where where this whole thing is headed. But I do not live in the community anymore, so if that's a problem for anybody, that needs to I be. Would, that wouldn't be a problem. I'll second it. <laughs> hey, hey, Matt, do we need to vote on those uh, separately, um, or or do can we just take a we a can Google we can do a, I believe we can do. Um, them together if there's only two and they've both agreed to be chair and vice chair. Um, so we can do it together as a, as a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, um, we'll kind of do this simultaneously, but uh, if they're all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, please say so now or put an emoji on your screen so I can see. 
looks like everyone is in favor of the motion for chair of Chris Iverson and vice chair George Dunkel. Yay. The railroad job is complete. <laughs> uh, we do have one final question from Janine. Um, if uh, you would like to stay on for that answer, uh, will funds ever come from taxes? I feel that could come up when sharing from the community. I can touch on that briefly, Janine. Um, when we meet at the next time, we'll obviously be kind of a more in-depth discussion about the financial um, possibilities for a new facility. I will tell you that internally, we're looking at mainly two sources um, for building this facility, and that would be either a geo bond or a utility fee. So those are two main options that we have seen in a multitude of the facilities that we have toured and talked about and seen um, locally in our papers around the state of Oregon. There is one facility, uh, Lincoln City, that did use their transient room tax as the funding source for their facility. Lincoln City is obviously is a huge um, tourism community. Um, for those that live in the community, there are only about 8,500 people in population. But when you include the tourism on a daily factor, it jumps up to about 20, 25,000 people potentially in that town um, for tourism activities. So there's a lot of motel, hotel taxes um, that come into that community and they did dedicate specific revenue from those taxes to pay for the police facility. And the individual from DA Davidson will um, talk about all those in way more in-depth um, discussion and answer any questions that you may have, um, as well as he may also discuss some other options that the city may look at. So uh, Chris, since you're the chair of the meeting um, or chair of the committee, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hey, my first official act, meeting adjourned. <laughs> Set a date for the next meeting. Yeah. Do, we, do we have a date for the next meeting? So, um, yes, I'm sorry, Chris. The next meeting is actually scheduled for, um, let's see, it's going to be... Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it is the third Tuesday, so it's going to be November 17th. Um, and it would be at the same time, four o'clock to 5.30. So I will send that meeting invite out um, to ensure that we have a good group that will be able to attend. But I will send that meeting invite out this week so you have it with plenty of time to knock out any other meetings you might have. <laughs> Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Sorry for the interruption. No, 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 that's fine. Does anybody have anything else that they'd like to talk about before we go ahead and hang up? Chris, if just, I could just, uh, oh, go ahead. Chris, if I could just say, I had an opportunity to review everything before the meeting, and I really appreciate what staff put together. I was able to, to basically be brought up to speed before the meeting, so, and then, plus I went over here, so I really yeah. got a good handle now where we're headed. I appreciate it. Yeah, me as well. I think they did a great job. So Keith, what did you have? Just to say everybody that the technology piece is gonna be huge on this and you know, trying to keep up with technology looking out 30, 40 years is gonna be almost impossible, but that's gonna be a huge chunk of change for this, for, for security and technology and everything, so. I agree. Anybody else? Thank you, just Thank sincere you. thanks for your time and being part of this effort. Right. Yep. Thank you to everybody. And with, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting and we'll talk to you all soon. Matt, I'll, I'll give you a call in the next day or two and, and have a discussion with you about this too. And we'll get the ball rolling. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank yep. you. Bye. 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 Yep.